Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Barometer Readings Monthly Conference Call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. Following the presentation, we will conduct a question and answer session, at which time instructions will be provided. For operator assistance during the call, please press star zero. I would now like to turn the meeting over to Sarah Potosky. Please go ahead, Ms. Potosky. Thank you, everyone, for taking the time to join us today on the Barometer Readings Monthly Conference Call. So my name is Sarah Potosky, Regional Vice President of Sales at Barometer. First of all, I'd like to thank all of our clients for your continued support. We're also pleased to announce the addition of Kayla Peacock to our business development team. Kayla will provide inside sales support to the advisors we work with across Canada. We're also excited about the recent launch of the Barometer Discipline Leadership Equity Fund. And David today is going to talk about the opportunities we see going forward. For those of you looking for a broader opportunity set, our new equity fund is run using the same investment approach, but not limited to yield securities. It is a portfolio now of about $10 million, and I know that Dave, Greg, and the team are quite excited about what they could do with a small fund. We have a few members of the Barometer Portfolio Management team on the call today. Joining us on the call is David Burroughs, President and Chief Investment Strategist. David is going to talk about the recent correction in development markets, where our work is pointing to, and where we see opportunity going forward. Cameron Hurst, Vice President and Portfolio Manager at Barometer, will provide his global market perspective. And Salman Malik, Portfolio Manager, will speak about our investments in the energy space across different asset classes. With that, I will pass it over to Dave. Great. Thanks, folks. Uh, thanks, everyone, for taking the time. Uh, what I thought maybe I'd do is talk a little bit about uh, what we're seeing coming out of some of our indicators, uh, where that's pushing us in portfolios, uh, give you a sense for where the portfolios are positioned now, some small changes that we've been making, uh, and then perhaps we can take some questions. Along the way, Cameron's going to talk a little bit about uh, how uh, we are positioning in the global portfolio, and, and Sal's going to talk about a couple of our key themes. So just, just off the top, uh, following uh, following uh, a very constructive year last year, uh, in many broad terms, our uh, sector and market risk work continues to be uh, positive. Our, when we look at uh, our global breadth models, uh, about 50% of stocks globally are in long-term price advances. Uh, that is a fairly stable number. Uh, in general, that uh, breadth reading has been improving. A couple things that are relevant about that. First of all, uh, at 50%, we are a long way from the 70 or 80% readings that make us concerned uh, about over-ownership of equities. Uh, we are solidly at midfield. <coughs> And in general, uh, the readings are improving. Some of our short-term indicators are mixed, uh, and I think that that's not an unusual thing after such a strong year last year. We're getting a little bit of consolidation early in this year, uh, but it's a very interesting market, uh, very different than the market in the 2011 and 12, where everything was very tightly correlated. Correlations uh, uh, market to market and sector to sector and stock to stock have been coming down which is great if you're a manager who likes to target. Uh, when we look uh, at the key themes, globally, developed markets are leading. Makes sense given the fact that they are so consumer driven and we've got falling inflation. Uh, developing markets are lagging. Some of the weakening currencies are putting pressure in some of the credit markets. Uh, and uh, weaker commodity prices in general have put some pressure on, on some of those markets. Uh, so, broadly speaking, the developed markets, specifically North America and uh, Europe, look like they're leading and from a relative strength perspective continue to improve. Developing markets, uh, South America and a lot of the Asian markets have in general been underperforming and weakening, which causes us to focus on the developed markets. <clears throat> from a correlation standpoint, it's interesting to note that uh, the developed markets to developing market correlation has fallen to about 30%. That's the lowest correlation in 20 years. So that's relevant because when you look at long cycles, it tends to be that emerging markets go through long periods of outperformance over developed markets. And when they ultimately roll over, developed markets tend to outperform for many years. And for about 18 months now, developed markets have been leading. Within the developed markets, correlations are also falling. So we've been from an over 90% correlation within the S&P in the late part of 2012 
to currently about a 50% correlation stock to stock and sector to sector, which means targeting sector themes and targeting uh, more concentrated portfolios can add value. So it's a very interesting thing. If we look at <clears throat> what's happened in the S&P, about six months ago, the S&P broke out to new highs coming out of the range it had been in since 2000. And as that happened, the correlation started to fall. We had a two multiple point expansion uh, in the S&P last year. So PE multiple went from about 13 times to about 15 times. And I know there was lots of commentary at year end about the fact that PE expansion like that uh, must mean we're gonna have correction that follows. I mentioned on the last call, there's three times in the last 50 years where you got PE multiple expansion of over two points in a year. All three cases happened during secular bull markets, multi-year bull markets. All three were followed by a second positive year, and in two of the three occasions, the third year was also positive. So in the 1990s, in eight out of 10 years, you had PE multiple expansion as inflation fell. From 2000 to 2012, there were no years of PE expansion. We had PE contraction through a secular bear market. And over the last 18 months, the first time we've seen PE expansion since 2000. It's relevant because when it happens, it tends to happen in bunches uh, through the 80s and the 90s. Largely, you had PE expansion in the period from 1945 to 66. You largely had PE expansion, uh, and that really only began about 18 months ago. So what does that mean for our portfolios? Well, in the income side, I think that we spent a lot of time talking over the last year about the rotation away from the interest rate proxies to sectors that are somewhat more economically sensitive. The breadth models pushed us away from things like REITs and utilities and telcos to sectors like financials and healthcare, consumer discretionary. Uh, that has worked out quite well. Uh, we're sitting currently in the, in the income uh, fund and pool at just over 90% equities. The focus very clearly is dividend growth. Uh, over 80% of our holdings in the last year have given us dividend in increases of anywhere from 3 to 35%. So it's largely equity focused, a little bit more economically sensitive. <clears throat> and our biggest weight would be in financials. Now financials, broad term, includes banks, insurance companies, and asset managers. We talked a lot about the asset management group as being a poster child for the type of sector we look for. Asset managers in, in large part became very out of favor over the last number of years as inflows uh, were curtailed. In the last 12 months, we've seen good net inflows into managers that had good returns. And so investments in companies like CI uh, and even the more recent one we made in Gluskin Chef have been very profitable. Uh, so financials continue to be a pretty big weight at about 25% of the portfolio. Energy infrastructure, which has been probably our most important theme in the last five years, continues to be a big big weight at over 20% of the portfolio. And you're going to get Sal to talk a little bit about an update in the energy infrastructure or midstream uh, energy companies. Uh, corporate debt is only about 8%. It's largely high yield focused, mainly because spreads are, are pretty narrow. <clears throat> and then from a sector perspective, following that up would be industrials, consumer, healthcare, uh, and technology. So uh, these obviously are somewhat lower yielding sectors. Uh, however, we're getting much higher dividend growth. So uh, in a world where interest rates remain very muted, we've said for some time we believe that interest rates probably are in a band of 25 to 3.5%. We're at the low end of that band. Uh, if rates stay muted based on low inflation and much better credit quality, uh, and still relatively modest growth, uh, we think that a dividend growth portfolio probably d continues to do quite well. So we want to thank you because we continue to see nice, good net flows. Um, in our last conference call, we made reference to the fact that one of the large U.S. Uh, uh, wealth managers uh, told us recently that uh, if you broke out their client base, the average client was 62 years old, they had just over 12% of their portfolio in cash, 18% including short-term deposits, and over 50% in bonds. So 70% in bonds and cash. Uh, it looks like looks to us as though that money is starting to migrate from those very safe havens to things with somewhat more growth 
and uh, maybe a little bit better uh, risk reward profile, uh, but that can go on for a long time. So we think a lot of that money, that 62-year-old investor, uh, is going to have to work its way through the dividend growth camp, and the dividend payout ratio in the S&P still is hovering down around 33%, well below the long-term average of 50%. So we're seeing rising dividends, rising dividend payouts, our earnings coming through the most recent quarter were good, and most importantly, we actually saw some revenue growth. Uh, that bodes well for dividend growth equities. However, we can only go so far with that theme. Uh, so on the equity products that we focus on, the equity pool and the new equity fund, uh, the holdings are a little bit more concentrated in the more economically sensitive groups. Uh, so to give you a sense for it, uh, while energy infrastructure is there uh, and the financials are there, we have a much larger weight in consumer cyclicals, uh, biotech and pharmaceutical, internet, uh, uh, semiconductors, uh, uh, and uh, machinery and tools. So the portfolio is more economically sensitive. Uh, it has lower yields attached, uh, higher growth rates. Uh, we are focused in a lot of secular growth themes in a market where growth is still relatively hard to come by, secular growth is trading in a premium. Uh, it's, a, it's an interesting market. <clears throat> there are some very clear long-term themes here. And in a secular bull market, those themes tend to last longer. And if you can be more concentrated in the portfolio, really take advantage of it. So the core themes for our equity portfolios would be consumer, technology, industrial, financials, and healthcare. Um, you will see on the holdings that we do have some basic materials listed. We are not heavily resource focused. We have actually quite light resource focus in the portfolios currently. They don't tend to outperform uh, when emerging markets are not. Uh, and we're not seeing significant improvement in breadth models there, but we have seen some real strength in chemicals and uh, lumber, both supplying into the recovery in the home building industry. And, we, and uh, we've got a couple of Canadian oil positions, one of our newer positions, Canadian Natural Resources, coming out of a big base. Maybe Sal will talk a little bit about that. So um, I'm going to stop there just for a moment. I'm going to pass it over to Sal. I'm going to get him to give us a little update on uh, the Midstream Energy Group and a little bit about our energy exposure. And then I'm going to get uh, Cameron to come on and talk a little bit about global positioning. Hey, thanks, Dave. Um, as you know, that we have been uh, very clear about this uh, secular bull market in the midstream space for over the past four or five years because when we look at the Canadian market, there are not many areas where you can find growth and, and a healthy yield. And midstream space is one where we find both. Um, we still believe that um, oil sand growth is going to grow from around 3 million barrels now to around total oil production is going to go from 3 million in Canada to around 4.5 to 5 over the next 3 to 5 years. And on top of that, by 2018 and 2019, we should start um, seeing LNG projects coming online, and we, we believe um, around 40 to 60 billion will be spent uh, on infrastructure. So the midstream companies who are involved in gathering, processing, and, uh, um, and moving uh, cash and other products are, are going to benefit. So they are still in a secular bull market. When we look at Alta Gas, we think they have the best exposure to LNG. Uh, when we look at um, moving uh, fractionating and moving liquids, Pembina has the best exposure uh, for gathering and processing alongside Kiera. Um, in terms of the gas pipeline, we think Verisan, um is a very well positioned. And when we run our uh, cash flow models, we see six to eight percent dividend increases coming from these companies for the next three to five years. Uh, so as long as interest rates stay within um, a range, uh, and, and, and that's the consensus here, is that we expect them to stay between two and a half to three and a half over the next year and a half. We think these companies can go through further multiple expansion. So we are very well positioned there. As you must have observed that it has been uh, it's, it's been a very cold winter, so for the first time we have seen um, the futures curve on natural gas uh, go up and stay above uh, around five bucks for a year out. So, um, so uh, for the first time we have added um, um, natural gas names, and 
as you know that uh, our process is discipline leadership and we always focus on the leading companies and sectors um, and the two leading names in natural gas, one in Canada, which is Tourmaline, which we think um, is going to increase production by over 35% this year. So just by the growth in production, um, you can see a further multiple expansion and they're not hedged, so higher gas prices help them. And in, on the U.S. side, we have range resources that has one of the best acreage in Marcellus, and um, they increased their um, uh, reserves by 33% and when they came out, when they made this announcement last, um, last week. So again, it's a company that's growing production, has an awesome resource, and is, can go through multiple expansions. So those would be the two names in the energy space that we have added recently. Um, another name that uh, we have added is uh, Baytex because we're always looking for um, an inflection point that leads to a multiple expansion. And, and Baytex uh, made an acquisition in the Eagleford Basin uh, that has enabled them to grow their production per share by 18%, reserves per share by, 18, by 16%, and um, they increased the dividend by 11%. So um, we think that the stock is going to go through revaluation and uh, uh, you might not see it in the portfolio, but we um, because the deal hasn't settled yet. But uh, it will, it, it will, you will be able to see it in in a week or two. We think that's a very good deal for Baytex. Um, and then the other uh, name that uh, Dave just mentioned, CNQ, uh, Canadian Natural Resources. We think the deal they did today is 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 quite good because um, buying those assets from Devon is going to provide them um, 650 to 700 million of run rate EBITDA going forward. Uh, with this acquisition, they get a lot of um, land, plus they get six uh, processing facilities, and uh, those facilities are not running at full capacity right now, so they can uh, increase utilization rate there. And the synergies from um, cutting costs and, and, and uh, reducing the amount of people working on these assets can add another $100 million in, um, in uh, synergies over the next uh, next year, so we think uh, the stock should get revalued. Um, so, uh, with this, um, I'll pass it to Cameron, and I guess Cameron will talk about the global team. So, I'm going to pass pass it over to Cameron. Uh, just just quickly on the on the global portfolio, as with all of our mandates, the sector weights don't tend to deviate very far. The positions, the individual positions, do. Uh, so if you were to look through the equity portfolio, this, the, the regular equity pool or the new equity fund, you know, weightings are in those five sectors we talked about. Uh, Cameron's going to talk a little bit about uh, the geographic exposures in the global portfolio and some of the positioning there. Great. Thank you, Dave. Um, why don't I start a little further afield in Japan and then work our way back, mostly because uh, the, the questions I've been fielding recently have predominantly been focused around Japan and the weakness. So. The economic surprise index over there has pulled back a bit after a string of really great data uh, and great performance last year, um, but some weaker data in the fourth quarter relative to rising and pretty high expectations. Um, we have to remember that Japan is really a policy story. So this, I mean, there's so much further behind the curve from the U.S. and even Europe um, in terms of the quantitative easing program and the progress to economic recovery that is sustainable. We were reminded of that actually just this week on Tuesday when the Bank of Japan came out and doubled the uh, bank lending facility, uh, extending the duration of it as well. And on that day, of course, the market ripped up 3%. So this really does uh, demonstrate or exemplify what Morgan Stanley coined as the CRIC cycle. Since uh, CRIC is the acronym, it stands for Crisis Response uh, Improvement and Complacency. So as we saw with uh, QE1, QE2, QE3, the market often starts to hesitate in front of the next response until you can see a path to that sustainable recovery. Being that Japan is still in a pretty early stage of this uh, cycle, we, we have seen some hesitation uh, and some breadth deterioration in the market, leading to us uh, being stopped out of some positions. So overall, the weight has uh, declined down to the mid-single digits in J our Japanese exposure, but we do uh, we do believe in the story and that ultimately the Bank of Japan and uh, the fiscal authorities will do what's necessary. It's just a bit further behind. Recently, we have seen the uh, yen stabilize, which uh, suggests we could be seeing uh, some stabilization in equities as well, but we're just going to be patient, wait and see what the market tells us. Now, um, when it comes to currency stabilization, <laughs> where you're not seeing that really is EM. Um, emerging markets is a source of, of significant pain and inconsistency, frankly. 
right now you're seeing across market action, uh, across different markets, sorry, uh, a number of different uh, approaches to the pressure that you're seeing from a stronger U.S. dollar and heavy debt loads. So Argentina fighting with some devaluation, um, you know, some uh, countries raising interest rates quite precipitously to try to fend this off. All in all, you know, I mean, Chinese economic momentum is anything but certain at this point in time and as likely to uh, underwhelm as uh, overwhelm. So really, EM is very inconsistent. We're not seeing it as a, an interesting place. The breadth models that we look at aren't suggesting that we're off base here. Credit has not confirmed the recent bounce in equities, so we remain pretty pessimistic on uh, the EM space. This all does come together to reinforce our view for developed markets over emerging markets, and that brings me across to Europe. So credit here has confirmed the recent strength in equities. Uh, when you look at the CDX across numerous countries, as well as corporate spreads, you continue to see improvement here. The UK actually looks the best. Uh, seems to me that the US is the furthest along, uh, and you can look at that from both an economic stability standpoint, as well as um, uh, from a quantitative easing or economic stimulus uh, perspective, is the furthest to an exit. The UK would be the next furthest along, and with good economic support, we continue to believe they'll be the next, the Bank of England will be the next uh, policy body to announce a withdrawal. We wouldn't take that negatively, quite to the contrary, as with the US, we would take that as a positive sign. With the housing support that they're seeing in the broad economic m momentum, um, the reds should be improving, and you're seeing uh, quite a positive response so far out of the FTSE this year to date. Looking a little further out of the UK, Germany continues to be strong, but I think most importantly, we're seeing breadth improvement in our models across the periphery, notably Spain and Italy. So while we are a little slow to engage this because of the asset quality review, which is happening in the middle of this year with results out in Q3, we think that this is one of the final steps towards a sustainable economic recovery once you patch the holes in the balance sheets at the banks. The US had to go through this. It wasn't the most enjoyable process, but everybody knows that the European banks are going to have to do the same thing. So in all likelihood, this will be uh, not taken that negatively once the results are actually understood and released in the third quarter. Capital holes can be filled and the EU can continue to move on. So for the time being, we really continue to prefer developed markets. Our breadth models point us in this direction. Credit's confirming everything we're seeing out of the models. Um, we're not looking for value or turnaround stories in Europe. We're looking for that consistent, good getting better story that uh, Barometer is known for. And at this point in time, the themes are all the same as they've highlighted financials, industrials, uh, more cyclical bent to the exposure. But in the global exposures, we can just take a slightly different geographic tack on that. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Cameron. So, you know, where do we go from here? I think so long as inflation continues to point lower uh, and as, as long as uh, energy prices remain relatively muted, especially gasoline prices, as long as debt servicing costs continue to come down for the consumer, uh, consumer free cash flow continues to move to new highs. So given the fact that there's a very high correlation between the PE of the S&P and consumer spending, we think it's likely the PE can continue to expand. From a, uh, uh, from a fuel standpoint, the average investor is underinvested equities. Average family has less than 19% of their net worth invested in stocks. Each of the two sec last secular bull markets peaked out with the average investor having over 30% of their holdings in equities, and that will take many years to get there. So having had one year of PE expansion under our belt and likely to see many more following, uh, we've chosen to take the same track that we did in 2001 when it looked as though income had embarked on a secular bull market. We started our income strategy at the end of 2000, beginning of 2001. It became a very successful strategy over the last 12 years. Uh, we've chosen to launch the new equity fund this year because we believe we're at the beginning of a new secular bull market for stocks, uh, where uh, many of the uh, securities that may lead along the way may not specifically be yield-based. We think that the high income strategy is a great strategy for the conservative investor to take advantage of the, of the move to dividend growth. And we were fortunately a little ahead of the curve getting there. Now the goal is to be ahead of the curve in the equity space. And as investors slowly reweight their equity holdings, we want to be buoyed on top of that. So uh, we think that uh, the outlook is great uh, going forward. I think that what you can expect is there will be corrections along the way, like the wobble we're seeing right now. The corrections should be much shallower in a secular bull market, and they should last a lot shorter periods of time, given the fact that there's money under the surface that needs to be repositioned. 
given the fact that correlations are coming down, I think that it's a great time for a targeted strategy, and we're seeing some very clear leadership themes in this market. So we're certainly happy to answer any questions that you might have. We appreciate you taking the time, uh, and uh, thanks, Cameron and Sal, for, for jumping on the call. So thanks again for taking the time out of your schedule to join us. The next monthly conference call will be held on Wednesday, March 26th at 4.15. For those of you looking for more information on the Income Fund, our pools, and on our new equity fund, please contact Kayla Peacock, Nick Hamilton, or myself. We look forward to having you join us on the next call, and please do not hesitate to contact any members of our team with any questions. With that, we'll open the floor to questions.